Sherilyn Skolnicki, and this is Brilliant Balance, the show for working women who are ready to shine. Each week, I bring you ideas, inspiration, and insight on balance, business, and getting it all done gracefully. You ready? Let's be brilliant. This is episode 289 of the Brilliant Balance podcast. And today we're talking about what we can do about gun violence with my guest, Don Lyons. So this episode is not a traditional topic for this show. And yet so much of my podcast listening base is made up of women who often are mothers. And collectively, I think the hearts of mothers are breaking as the incidence of gun violence in our schools continues to escalate. And when the mass shooting at the Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee, took place just a few weeks prior to this recording, in which seven people lost their lives, including three children, I think that one brought the year's school shooting count to 89 with 75 total victims injured or killed. And overall, guns have become the leading cause of death among children and teens. In fact, one out of 10 gun deaths occur at age 19 or younger. And firearm deaths occur at a rate more than five times that of drownings. So as a parent myself, And as someone who has a a collective audience of parents listening and looking for answers, it was clear to me immediately that the person who I wanted to bring onto the show to have a conversation about this was Dawn Lyons. And the reason is that Dawn and I actually go way back. Dawn and I first met when we were both working at Procter & Gamble. She and I were both marketers who shared hallway space, and I thought immediately of Dawn when I was feeling this prompting to use this platform to say something. I knew that Dawn would be someone who could help me find the words and the message. Not only did Dawn and I work together at P&G, we also were in a small group Bible study together and you know collectively navigated the ups and downs of our work lives and our marriages and those early parenting years before she and her family moved to Connecticut and then at some point after she had moved to Connecticut Don reached out and said hey there's a few things in my life that are definitely not going the way that I want right now and she went through a coaching experience with brilliant balance and So she is a proud Brilliant Balance alum on top of all of the other things that she does. And today, she serves in a very important role as the COO of Sandy Hook Promise, where she is working just tirelessly to end gun violence in schools. So Sandy Hook Promise, we're going to talk a little bit more about in the interview with Dawn. I want you to understand what they are about and what they are not about and also the resources that are available for us as people, um, individual mothers and parents and listeners who want to do something proactive, whatever we can do to reverse this trend that we're all witnessing. I really value her perspective. I value the depth of her subject matter expertise and her deep, deep heart for service. And she will join us now without further ado. So Dawn, thank you for being with us today. I am so honored that you made time to be on the show. And I'm curious, what else is on your agenda today at work or at home? Yeah. So I'm actually very excited to be doing some interviews today. So we're growing our team at Sandy Hook Promise. So I'm very hopeful for having some really amazing people growing our team very soon. And then after that, get to take the kids to uh, lots of practices. So I have two kids, a 12-year-old and a nine-year-old, very busy in the spring sports. So we have lots of baseball and softball and soccer, all kinds of fun things. So a busy day, but very glad to have this time with you. Full, 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 right? Life is full in this chapter. Yeah. So your organization, Sandy Hook Promise, was founded after 
the absolutely tragic Sandy Hook school shooting in 2012. Yeah. In that school shooting to reground people, 26 people lost their lives. And it was to this day, I believe, the deadliest mass shooting at an elementary school in U.S. history. So tell us about Sandy Hook Promise and its mission. Yeah, I would love to. So Sandy Hook Promise's mission is to educate and empower youth and adults to prevent violence in schools, homes, and communities. So while it was founded by family members who uh, lost their loved ones in that tragedy, they really had the hope that no one else would have to go through that kind of tragic heartbreak that they went through. So as a part of that process, they founded this organization with other family members at the time. And uh, a month later, they really started to figure out what could this look like? And so originally, they started to try to pass uh, universal background checks. So meeting with people in Congress and figuring out how do we get something that would help prevent the most tragedies from happening. So while it would not have actually prevented the Sandy Hook tragedy, they were trying to find the things that would be most impactful and save the most lives. And then after months of talking with legislators, that legislation failed and so it was a very devastating moment for them. And then at that time, they said, this can't be the only way, right? It can't just be policy. It can't just be legislation that can help solve this issue. So they had a lot of conversations with the FBI and the FBI agents who were involved in the case had said, you know, every time there's one of these mass shootings, there are these warning signs. There, there are things that happen beforehand that we see that that preempt these tragedies. And Nicole Hockley, our co-founder and, and current CEO, had said, well, why doesn't anyone tell anyone about these things? Why aren't people sharing this more? And the, they said, well, they, it would just be too hard to educate everyone. We can't possibly do it. And she said, well, then we will. Oh. Um, so it was really a lot of work from that point of figuring out what are these warning signs? How do we understand this more? And a lot of experts coming together, psychologists, people working in schools as well, figuring out what these programs could look like and making sure that we had a holistic approach that still included the policy side, but also was developing what these programs could look like and what these warning signs are. And that's really what we focus on today with our Know the Signs programs. Amazing. And we're going to dig in for everyone listening to these programs that are available and how we can get them into our communities in cases where they're not there already. Before I go there, I want to just talk about the data on the increased incidence of school shootings. Yeah. Because as a parent, my first inclination was like, is this is this just like what I think is true or is this actually true, right? It certainly feels like the incidence is increasing yeah. and we're all heartbroken when there's even one, but when it feels like there's kind of building momentum, I mean, I think many of us in our age bracket don't remember anything before Columbine. Mm -hmm. Columbine was such a, you know, it's one of those moments that like, as I look back on my adult life, I can tell you where I was. I can right. tell you who I was with. I can tell you what our conversation was. Yeah. But the data on how, as I went to look for it, the data on how the incidence of school shootings has increased is positively staggering. I mean, it's so here's some thing. I'm going to read a few facts that I pulled. So yeah. since Columbine, which was in 1999, more than 338,000 students in the U.S. have experienced gun violence at school. Like full stop on that. There were more school shootings in 2022, there were 46, than in any year since Columbine. And that year, 34 students and adults died and 43,000 children were exposed to gunfire at school. I mean, Don, I can hardly say those words without like, ugh. So Amen. my question is why? Yeah, it's a, a great question. And it is hard to ask that question without thinking about your own families, right? Um, and so really with what we're seeing, there's there's a combination of things that are happening that all need our attention. And some of those have gotten worse over the last several years. And so one of the things that we really pay a lot of attention to is mental health of youth. And so 
after uh, and through the pandemic, a lot of those things have gotten a lot more difficult for youth. And if you think about intersectionality of other issues that might be causing mental health issues of not feeling accepted, not feeling uh, included in their school environment or in their communities, or sometimes even by their own family members for various reasons, that could be another conflating issue. And there's a lot of kids that don't know how to handle their emotions. And so that's very important to make sure that we are looking at that as a part of uh, the factors into this. And we've also seen as a part of that, we have a, a program called our Say Something Anonymous Reporting System, where kids are able to uh, submit tips anonymously. And we saw tremendous upticks over the last several years of kids who are self-reporting, kids who are saying, I'm having severe anxiety, I'm having uh, thoughts of suicide, I need help, I'm in severe depression, what do I do? Wow. Um, and so when you combine that with the fact that there are more guns in the US than ever before, it's not to say there's anything wrong with someone who chooses to be a sensible gun owner and who is following laws and, and keeping themselves and anyone in their household safe, but that access to guns can often be a lethal combination for these kids. And so since 2020, more than 61 million guns have been legally purchased in the US. And so oftentimes, whenever those guns are in a home that might have children, those are not secured safely. They are easily accessible or at least somehow accessible for the children in that home. And when they're having one of these um, times of crisis or they feel like there's no other path forward and they have access to that gun, that's where we see these horrible things come together. And one of the, the key things with that, that is, it's easy to lose hope. And this is part of our organization is that we don't want people to lose hope. There's always, as in everything that we talk about, this arc to hope. So, so there is some things that are helpful in this that help us to prevent these things before they happen. So more than two thirds of school shooters get a gun that is used in their attacks from their home or from someone who is a friend. So if we are able to get secure storage for those guns, that can be a preventative factor. And then we also know that many of these people who are potential perpetrators have told someone about their plans most of the people who end up committing these acts of violence, it's a cry for help. And if we don't hear that cry for help before that tragedy, it can end in deadly consequences. But we need to pay attention to those warning signs and those, those clues that tell us this person needs help and they need intervention before something like this can happen. I mean, you just packed so much into those few minutes. With, and Again, I'm just sitting here thinking, I am so grateful that when I felt the prompting to do an episode on this subject that I knew to call you. Like, I just, like, I'm so grateful that you are so deep into this that you can speak to what we can do because it's so easy to feel helpless. Yes. Right? To kind yeah. of throw up our hands and think this is too big and there is nothing that we can do about this. And so, I want to circle back to some of these signature programs that you yeah. have started to mention. You have one called Say Something. Yes. It, this can be delivered at no cost in any school or youth organization. So if someone listening were to say, I want to bring this to my school or to a youth organization, they could do it. Tell us about Say Something. Yes, would love to. So the Say Something program came from this idea and, and doing a lot of research, years of research that we're actually still continuing to research on, that there are these warning signs that are evident before these tragedies can happen. And so these programs are all about educating youth and the adults in their lives what these warning signs are, how to understand what they are, how to acknowledge them and to say something before a tragedy can happen. And so oftentimes these warning signs can happen online, on social media. And so a lot of the things that people end up saying is, oh, well, I thought it was a joke or um, I didn't really take it seriously. So the whole training is about not just recognizing the warning signs, but also making sure that people are taking them seriously and they're acting immediately when they yes. see those things. They're they're not using those excuses. They're not saying it was it's a joke or maybe it'll go away. They're acting immediately and they're telling a trusted adult to make sure that they can take action. 
And then in addition to that, we have our Say Something Anonymous reporting system that I mentioned earlier, where people are able to anonymously report a tip either through a website or an app or our hotline that enables them to give the details of something that might have happened, but then they don't have to feel personally at risk or fear of, of being called a snitch or any of the other things that we know weigh on kids' minds. So we want to make sure with this training that they feel empowered to bring that message forward. And I'm very grateful to say that with the programs, we've had 15 averted school shootings. And so that's incredible. It's also a uh, a bittersweet thing to say, right? Because we're so grateful that those towns aren't in the headlines. Those schools aren't going to be forever changed. There's still kids that get to sit at their dinner table tonight because of that. But there was also a kid who was driven to the brink, right? And so they were very close, that close to having something like that happen and to act out in violence. And so we also want to make sure that those students are taken care of and that the whole collective uh, school community can really heal from even those moments as well. Absolutely. And I you're, I think it's so telling that the organization is thoroughly looking at like, what would be the impediments to someone reporting? You know, no kid wants to be a snitch. No right. parent wants to report another parent's child and, right. and be wrong, right? Or be right. Like there's just, yeah. there's not easy wins here. So the anonymity of being able to report, this question just occurred to me, but what happens then? So when a tip comes into the line, then what? Yeah. So great question. We have an amazing crisis center that is the service behind that program. So they're based in Miami, Florida, and we have, um, I think, around 15 crisis counselors. So every tip that comes in is triaged by that group, and it either goes into life safety or a non-life safety bucket. And so with the life safety, they have contacts at every school district that we are partnering with and the local law enforcement and emergency services as well. So if someone calls in and says, I am suicidal and I'm going to do this tonight, we can immediately take action. They can contact those local authorities and get someone to those kids before something can happen. And so on the non-life safety pieces, we help go through those as well and help kids and kind of talk through as you would a crisis text line or some of the other great services that are out there. And then making sure that we're contacting back to the school and working with them to make sure that those kids are getting the services that they need. Amazing. Hi, it's Cheryl Ann. Thanks for listening. Did you know that the ideas I share on this show are things I also can help you implement? If you want me in your corner, helping you find more time for what fills you up, go to brilliant-balance.com forward slash schedule and sign up for a free exploratory call. Give yourself this time. You'll be so glad you did. You know, when you think about it through that lens, Dawn, of a child in crisis or an adult in crisis for that matter, yeah. who is, you know, it's these it's these moments of indiscretion that change yeah. everyone's lives forever, right? And if we can just catch that before that moment and have yeah. the intervention that's appropriate, like this is where that prevention work comes in. Like there is a right. different pathway, a different outcome if they can get emotional regulation support, if they can get medication support, like whatever is needed. Yeah. I want to talk about the critical warning signs of impending violence because sure. so much of this is recognizing what is worth reporting. So I have a list in front of me. I'm not I'm trying to like test you, although I am yeah, confident sure. you have these committed to memory. <laughs> so can we go through a few, whichever ones you think, and then I'm going to point people to the site and to the list as well. Right. Yeah. So some of the warning signs, and I think the, the interesting thing to keep in mind as we think about the warning signs is that sometimes it might just be one of those warning signs, and sometimes it might be many of them all together, and there's no secret recipe of how these things show up, right? Which is why it can be challenging, but it's also so important to be aware of what they are and to be vigilant whenever you see something presenting itself. And so some of those warning signs could include uh, suddenly withdrawing from friends and family and activities. So something that someone was, you know, very, very interested in and super passionate about before the soccer team or, you know, glee club or something like that. And suddenly 
quitting those things and, and pulling back and just re being reclusive from their connections. Uh, persistent bullying we see is often a factor within this, either as somebody who has been bullied and is kind of feeling fed up and feels like they need to kind of act back and, and stand up for themselves and they choose violent ways to do that. Experiencing chronic loneliness and social isolation. So people who might be that loner who doesn't have a connection with anyone else or who doesn't have someone that they can connect with as a friend within their school. Somebody making direct threats. We always include that because it really is something that presents itself quite often of someone saying, I'm going to shoot up the school tomorrow, or I have a bomb and I'm going to use it on yeah. all of you. So those things are important not to ignore. Dismiss. And yeah. they do get dismissed. I mean, I think they that's do. a piece of this is that it's be our cultural language has become yes. so aggressive and violent through television and film. And so you know, what we're sort Absolutely. of exposed to video games, like the level of violent language that I think we have built a tolerance for is yeah. I think especially when you're a middle school age child or a, you know, it's it's hard to discern like what it what are they serious are they just kidding is this language we use so that I think as a parent I think a lot about helping my child regulate their language yeah and say like listen when you say that someone does not know if you like mm -hmm. you you're using the most aggressive version of describing the thought or the emotion right. or the feeling it comes back to that emotional regulation piece that we've talked about so yeah. the key thing is we can't ignore any of it but we right. also as parents can talk to our children about modulating their language so that it matches you know kind of the size of the emotion yeah the the notion of a direct threat we we actually had this at my children's elementary school a few years ago and mm -hmm. Someone did exactly what you're recommending. And there were a couple of things said on social media about a child from a child who did not go to the school. Yeah. But lived very, very close to the school. And they did take action. They determined that the child did not have access to a firearm. However, there were a lot of steps that happened after that in terms of that child being removed from the situation that were very reassuring to and helpful, I think, both to the individual kid who was involved and in crisis yeah. and also to the families who were sending their kids to that school. So like I, okay. you know, we think about that a lot as those kids were really brave to say, I don't think yes. we don't take this seriously. They knew this child. They felt a lot of like pressure of, are we like, is it the right thing to do to say this or not? Right. And yet who knows what could have happened if that child developed access to a firearm in some way. You know? Yeah, it's a great point. And actually, there's another program that we have called our Save Promise Clubs. And those are youth led clubs across the country. We have uh, 4,400 of them. And it's all about creating that culture of being an upstander. And so telling kids it's okay, what you're doing is you're standing up for each other and you're actually helping the kid. You're not being a tattletale because it's not to get them in trouble. It's to help them and to help the others in the school. And so making sure that they understand that difference, which can sometimes be challenging for kids to really understand. So having those clubs that help kids to see others of their peers who are doing this, who are saying, hey, it's okay, it's all right to be doing this really means a lot to have that peer to peer leadership and understanding of what it looks like to be an upstander and how to really make sure that everyone in the school is vigilant about preventing violence. Yes. So I know that everyone listening will want to do something. There's just yes. comfort in taking some kind of specific action. Yeah. Can we talk about some things that we can do? Obviously, we can bring this program to our school or youth organization if it's not already there. We can talk yeah. to our own kids. I mean, I think these are the yes. obvious ones. What yeah. else can we do? Yeah, I mean, those are really important. And I think it's educating yourself on what those warning signs are and then also refreshing it because it can be something if you're not always thinking about it, it can be something that kind of regresses back in your brain and isn't really top of mind, but it's really important to think about. And then we also have uh, still a lot of work on the policy side that is both about gun violence prevention and also about school safety. And so a lot of the legislation that we've passed over the last several years is all about bringing programs like this to more schools 
And so being supportive of legislation that does that is very helpful, including you know, support for mental health, support for suicide prevention, and other violence prevention programs. And then also, as we talked about how important it is for safe storage, if you have a gun in your home, making sure that it is secured safely and that the children in your home or even who have access to your home, maybe nieces, nephews, or, or grandchildren or otherwise, making sure that they don't have access either. And then supporting laws that support that as well. So there is legislation happening in a lot of places that can help to supplement some of these great things that are happening because we want to make sure while it's so important to educate our kids on what these signs are and having them feel empowered, we can't put it all on their shoulders. That's not fair, right? So we need to be the adults um, who are doing the right things for our children and getting those right kind of safeguards in place. And with that policy work, one of the most important things I think about our organization and, and the work that we do on legislation is that everything that we do is approached in a bipartisanship way. So we have passed laws with Obama, with Trump, with Biden in very, very red states and very blue states and everything in between. And so that's really important to make any headway in this space. It can be very difficult, right? Because it is something that people feel very passionate about in one way or another. But finding that middle ground that we can agree on is so critical. And that's really what we focus on. Um, and so last year, passing the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act Sandy Hook Promise was a huge piece of bringing those parts of our legislators together. So working very closely with Senator Cornyn from Texas and Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut and finding what is that common ground. It, it's hard to find a more red or more blue state in some ways. So how do you make sure that they can work together? And they did. And they were able to pass legislation, uh, the largest piece of legislation that was really targeting gun violence prevention in over 30 years. So there is a way and there's hope. And right now there's a lot of state level legislation as well. So making sure that you're aware of what's going on, what are the laws in your state, what is trying to be passed and see what kinds of things that you can do to help that. And there's a huge place in this uh, discourse for gun owners to be a part of this and to show they don't want to see this anymore either. So there's actually way more common ground here than what the news and the headlines would allow you to think. And so that's something that we really focus on and finding those ways to get those things passed. So that's another big, big piece that we would say for everyone to do. Huge. Listeners, please, please do this for me. Go to sandyhookpromise.org and just avail yourself of the resources that are there. You'll find this list of things that you can do that Dawn has been talking us through to volunteer, to advocate, to give. You'll find also a lot of the data that I was sharing today, as well as more information about these various programs that are happening. And this is, you know, I always say this, Dawn, when there's a crisis. I remember saying this when COVID was first kind of becoming a thing, right? Yeah. In, in March of 2020. That when there are sort of sweeping movements that feel overwhelming to me, and COVID yeah. was one of them, and this is one of them, I don't try to rely on my own understanding, right? Mm -hmm. there, I am not spending my life educating myself about gun violence right. and schools and safety and me children's mental health. So list, finding the people who are mm -hmm. and listening to the people who are is like a shortcut to years of education. Absolutely. Like for me to have to go find this information and and catch up right on my own is right. not, it's not possible. So yeah. finding sources we can trust that are balanced, that mm -hmm. are, you know, sensible and measured and diligent in the effort is such a critical thing. And I'm so grateful to have Sandy Hook Promise and you available Thank to you. us. Thank yes, you for being with you. us today, my Yes, friend. and we would love any other feedback as well. If there are other resources, we're constantly hearing from people and adding to the resources that we have. And there's a lot on the website too about how to talk to your kids about gun violence, how to talk to them about things that are happening in their school. Now, uh, practically every kid in the country has some form of lockdown drills. So some of them uh, have more challenges in that than others. Um, and sadly, in some parts of the country, they are going even beyond the lockdown drills and doing um, simulations that can be incredibly damaging. And so trying to stand against some of those things that uh, are just, 
even worse for the mental health of our youth as well. So that's a, a big focus. And, and I think the other uh, part to your point, whenever it is such a weighty topic and uh, really has so much emotion packed into it, making sure that you're also treating yourself with self-care. Um, I'm in this work every day and that's so important for us. And I don't even read every article, right? Because you just can't. And sometimes you just have to say like, uh, enough is enough. I can't, I can't engage in that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you can still see where there's areas that you can make progress and make hope in this space. And I think that's an area where uh, with Nicole Hockley and Mark Barden, who are our CEOs, who both had their sons killed at Sandy Hook, they have never lost hope ever since that horrific day. And they have their moments, of course, of course, but they are continuing to go forward and make continued progress in this. And it's inspiring. And so I think that's another piece I would love if all of the listeners would um, find some of the great clips that we have in our newsroom on our website and just hearing either of them speak so genuinely is is really moving and touching and they're doing some great work as leaders of our organization so would love to invite everyone to do that thank you don thank you for being with us and yeah, thank you i'm just deeply deeply grateful my friend Oh, well, thank you. I'm so grateful to be on here and just to have had this conversation. It's an important one. So I really appreciate the opportunity. So thank you for listening today. I know fully well how difficult this topic is to talk about. It's not something we want to think about. It's not something we want to give any more attention to. And I'm just so grateful to Dawn for giving us these really practical things that we can do with our own children and in our own schools and in our own communities. And I would just invite you once again to go take a look at the resources on their site, which we've linked in the show notes, and find your way in whatever way feels right to you to play a part in reversing this trend and keeping our children safe. That's all for today, my friends. Till next time, let's be brilliant. This is the podcastfactory.com.